Hello, BookTube. Well, as you can see, I have a guest. This is the author, Dennis Romano, the author of this great big book, Venice. <laughs> Look at that from Oxford University Press. What a beautiful production. Hello. Welcome to the channel. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. This is, as you can tell, a gigantic one volume history of Venice. And a number of you over the years have asked me, what do you recommend for a big one volume history of Venice? This is no small undertaking, though, to do a thing like this. Yeah, no, I mean, I retired from Syracuse in, in 2016, and basically I've spent the last seven years full-time working on this book. And in one weird way, COVID was a blessing because I couldn't leave the house, and I think the book got done a bit, bit quicker than it would have because I was stuck there all day, and fortunately I had the library right behind me and just <laughs> kept plugging away. One aspect of Venice's history I think is more true than most other great city state nation whatever you want to call it these great polities and it's, a, it's an aspect that you know perfectly well from an earlier book of yours which is that no matter which individual you hunker down on you're going to find an 800 page book <laughs> there's plenty of information plenty of documentation and it's all fascinating yeah i mean one of the great things about working in venice is it has such an extraordinary archive and you can basically almost ask any question and go to the Venetian archives and find some sort of answer. Of course, there's giant holes in the records, but still, if you're persistent and if you dig around and if there's great archivists, which there are, which will point you in the right direction, it's a lot of fun. It's like a, you know, a mystery, and you're trying to figure out who done it. You know? So, so before we get to specifics of the book, you you just brought up something that I have to know about. I, I'm endlessly curious. So, so the archivists in Venice know the treasure they have. They're good with, with inquiring scholars? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. they really know their archive incredibly well. And, you know, they're very willing to help people and they'll point you where they think you need to go. And if they don't know the answer, they'll try to help you find it. Is uh, one, one more one more archival question? Sure. Sorry. It's a deadly temptation to ask a historian an archival question. We will pull away from that shore as fast as possible. Right. You have one more nerdy question. Is the archive, are the archives of Venice a living thing? Are discoveries made? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, also because we're always asking new questions, right? I mean, as, right. as right. our own society changes, we're asking, you know, so people can go back to stuff that you'd think has been worked over and worked over and worked over. But if you go in with a different perspective, you'll find new answers. So I'm curious to know, with, with a, a big history like this that delves into every detail over a thousand years or more, surely there's a Venetian origin story for Dennis Romano. <laughs> surely there is. I mean, this book is not about Minsk. Right? What, what right. is the Venetian origin story? For me, the Venetian origin story is actually pure serendipity. I wanted to do medieval French history. And I was all set as an undergrad to go to France first semester. They didn't have enough people to go on the program. Oh. I was I was depressed. I was walking across campus. This was a Wake Forest. And I saw this little poster. It said, we've just gotten a house in Venice. We're looking for people to go. I thought, eh, I don't know. I kind of know where it is, but I kind of don't. I'll go there because um, I just wanted to go somewhere. And when I got there, I realized, medieval Italian history is urban history. Medieval French history is rural history. And cities are interesting places. And so that was my road to ruin was, you know, walking, seeing that poster and going off to Venice. Now, after all those years you've been involved in, you've been writing about Venice for a long, long time. All those years, at some point or other, you mentioned COVID as a, as a factor. But hovering in your mind for how long was the idea that maybe you would add to the library of one volume histories of venice it's that probably i'm sorry it's just that probably started about 20 years ago actually i was approached by my former editor johns hopkins he wanted me to write a history of venice and i was writing a, a, a completely different book at the time and i said i can't do this right now uh and then uh, unfortunately, he passed away and left, and had already left Johns Hopkins. And then Oxford approached me uh, and asked me to write one. And so uh, I was very pleased they did. Uh, my editor was fabulous, and um, she was a tremendous help. Uh, 
and really helped me think about what I wanted to do here. Her name's mm -hmm. Susan Ferber, by the way. I often, uh, I often joke when people say, you know, if only there were an immortality treatment, we could keep Mother Teresa alive forever. And I always say, no, you want to keep good editors alive forever <laughs> because they have a distressing habit of making all your dreams come true and then popping off the twig. <laughs> It'd be great if you could give them an injection once in a while. Absolutely. <laughs> already rotten books they deal with, they probably consider that a curse. <laughs> <laughs> True. Absolutely. The thing that I noticed in this book, I got the sense of it. I'm just a reader, so I might be mm -hmm. wrong. Ordinarily, when I read Histories of Venice, I get the impression, I can almost hear the author wishing that this doge's memoirs were longer or this princess had written more in her diary or whatnot and in your book i got the distinct impression that what you wanted more than anything was diaries from the dock workers diaries yes. from the canal managers diaries from the people of the city as opposed to the luminaries yeah that was always my interest i mean my my very first book, you know, I was always interested in the lower classes in Venetian society because, well, it was sort of coming out of the 1980s, you know, the new social history. People were looking at society from the bottom up. And, you know, I really got into that topic then. And uh, then that topic sort of went away for a while. And now there's a whole young generation of people that are coming back to those questions again. So, yeah, I've always been interested in, you know, uh, the unsung heroes of Venetian society. Uh, the rich and famous, you know, they they get their five minutes in the sun, you know, and we know about them. And I mean, obviously, we're incredibly indebted to them. But the stevedores and the people who sell trinkets to, to the tourists today, and the maids and the servants and the, and the enslaved people, they were as important in Venetian history as the doges and the bishops, for sure. I wonder if if the ebb and flow of that of those social history bottom up movements is connected with public awareness of wealth inequality. Those two things are connected. But all well, of a sudden, I, a whole generation of people who realize they're never going to own a house. So why yeah. would I want to? Why would I want to write about princes and kings? Why would I yeah. want to study them? I yeah, things are connected. But, um, well, I think you know so much of what's going on right now in our own politics is about people who are not who feel like their voice isn't being heard. Um, you know, for good or for ill, and we, you know, how that's playing out. But I think the same thing, you know, I really wanted to to try to bring their voices in as much as possible. Um, okay. And so also to really, go ahead. How I'm possible sorry. is that? With, with the materials that you would encounter in an archive, how possible is that? I think, I think it's a wonderful job in this book, better job than I've seen in any Venetian history. Yeah. But I think, I think it's possible. I mean, the great saving grace is last wills and testaments, um, which there are thousands and thousands oh, wow. of them, you know. And so, you know, you can read. Now, sometimes they're incredibly short. You know, some patricians and noblemen's, you know, will will be 20 pages long. Uh, servants might be, you know, two paragraphs, but they tell you something. They tell you who they left their meager possessions to, yes. who, oh, who wow. they named as their executors. And, you know, so... Those are a huge source. I hadn't um, thought about that. Suddenly, those people pop into the legal record. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and maybe and the notaries. First time in their life, other than maybe their christening, that might yeah. be the first time in their life. But... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So they're incredibly important. Yeah. So can I can I get you to do a little bit of extrapolation? I don't think there's anyone in the world in a better position to extrapolate than you. And I've got you right here. So. Okay. <laughs> those people. Those ordinary people, uh, uh, you know, a prosperous baker owns three shops on three blocks. He has a manager of one of his shops. He can't be everywhere at once. So this manager is not, he's not the kid sweeping out the ovens. He's a, a substantial person. He'll never leave a written record. He'll have a family. He'll have grandchildren. He'll die of an illness. He'll have all sorts of interests. Maybe he'll be passionately political, but he'll never leave a record except for his will and he will have things to leave behind he'll have a house maybe to leave behind or something like that someone like that let's mm -hmm. say in i don't know 1670 how free would that person have thought he was or would he have even had our conception of what it means to be free what would he have thought about his daily life as a person right he's not he's not a faceless drudge anymore he's not a, on a work gang dredging a canal he's he has substance 
Would right. he felt free in any sense that we know the word? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think in your hypothetical year of 1670, he might have to, have to some extent. I mean, because there was a lot of ferment at the time. There were a lot of, in that period, there were quite a few people from the sort of middling ranks who were having a real impact in Venetian society, not politically necessarily, but in terms of economic power. If we go back three, 400 years, he might not have felt the same way. Um, on the other hand, you know, again, I'm giving a very equivocal answer here. You know, if he was in his guild, the Baker's Guild, he might be head of the Baker's Guild, you know, and so he would have a degree of power. Um, he sits on the board of the Baker's Guild or he sits on the board of his local confraternity. I think the notion of freedom that in the sense that you and I are probably using the word, he probably wouldn't have thought that way. Um, they really do think society is hierarchical. Um, and, you know, you kind of know your place. And so, the notion of you, upward social mobility, you know, they don't really have that in the same sense that we do. Um, so he wouldn't have had our sense of freedom and he might not have wanted it. Right. It was almost inconceivable to him, you know, that you could become, you can't become a nobleman, right? I mean, right. now, if you're lucky and you're well rich enough, you can give your daughter a big dowry. She can marry a nobleman. Right. So your grandkids could be noblemen. And I'm sure that at points in the city's history, at many points in the city's history, a prosperous baker could lend money to a nobleman. <laughs> that's right, because there's lots of poor no. I mean, that's the other weird and interesting thing about Venice is because it's a hereditary class of nobles, you can be impoverished and be a nobleman because it's your birth that determines your status, not your economic path. So there are lots of poor noblemen in Venice and they're desperate. I mean, they're selling their votes to the rich guys all the time. They're begging for jobs that will give them a small salary. Um they are many ways the drivers of Venetian politics because the rich guys, the rich nobles, use them as clients. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, they come and say, look, there's even a group of them that one Renaissance diarist nicknames the Swiss because they're like Swiss mercenaries of the time. They sell their <laughs> they sell their votes, you know. Uh, <laughs> these people, not not just centering on my on my baker's helper or whatever, but any of these people, any of the people who aren't the rulers, the the names that we know that are on giant marble tombs, any of the normal people, they're seeing the ships come and go from all over the world. They're seeing the ships go out and stay gone for years on expeditions to places their imaginations can't even conceive. Do you get a sense of when the people of Venice started to realize that they were the people of Venice? When did they start to take on the incredibly cosmopolitan attitude of, of such an amazing trading hub, such an internationally recognized thing. Right. Well, I think the first thing to realize is so many of these people of Venice are immigrants themselves. Wow. I mean, you know, probably at any point, almost throughout its history, 20% of the population of Venice is born somewhere else. Because like every medieval and Renaissance city, is, Venice can't reproduce itself, right? I mean, you know, so you have to have immigration. And so, you know, so I think they're more cosmopolitan than we realize because your next door neighbor is from Albania and your the person who lives below you is from Verona and the person, the slave across the street owned by the, oh, it sounds terrible to say, but owned by the nobleman is um, a Tartar from the Black Sea. And so I think they're more cosmopolitan than we realize. Um, and so many people do work in the, on the ships. So there are, you know, there's four or 5,000 in the Renaissance, there's four or 5,000 seamen who go out on these ships. And so a big portion of the population, uh, actually has experienced traveling the Mediterranean or to the North Sea, uh, where the Venetian trade routes led them. So they're aware, I think, in many ways of what's going on around them. Yeah, those stories spread. Like, yeah. The, yeah. Those people don't just keep to themselves. So that industry builds and builds, gets more and more powerful. Venice, of course, becomes a, a traded war trophy a couple of times in later centuries. And in your book, 
those matters reach a choke point mm -hmm. are we going to have the city itself be the hub of commerce knowing what it does to a city for it to be the hub of commerce or are we going to move the commerce somewhere else and okay the city into something that it an idea of itself okay uh, you mean like once we get to the 20th century right, right. Um, in your book you describe that venice makes a decision to become venice <laughs> yes is, i don't know of an equivalent yeah yeah i mean they were facing a crisis in the 19th century where like everywhere in europe a uh, heavy industry was booming and especially in italy with the nation state having just recently been created where genoa is really taking off and so the venetians their old rival is genoa of course they want to get in on this they've got a lot of natural resources on the mainland especially all those rivers create hydroelectric power and so there's this famous guy named giuseppe volpe he's often called the last doge uh he and he he's in the hydroelectric industry and he has surplus energy um hydroelectric uh, electrical power and so he starts to create industries that will use up this hydroelectric power but then the question becomes okay are we destroying the city itself um john ruskin of course stones of venice comes to venice and is horrified because a bell tower of one of the churches is now a smokestack you know, there's a factory there and they've turned the bell tower into a smokestack. Um, when they build the railroad, they want to, there's a idea to bring, to build the train station at San Giorgio Maggiore, that beautiful Palladian church across the basin from San Marco. Can you imagine, you know, bringing the train all the way into the smack dab in the city? It's like what America did with our, you know, um, highways in the 1950s and 60s, just plow through the city. Uh, well, the Venetians were thinking about doing that. And then Volpe and a guy named Piero Foscari um, said, wherever is the lagoon, there is Venice. So let's move heavy industry to the mainland, to right to the edge of the lagoon. And they get the Italian government to agree, and they build this huge port facility um, and so heavy industry gets moved to the mainland. And, but of course, Volpe also has major interest in hotels. <laughs> and so, and he helps bolster the Biennale. And so what it means is the island city, what you and I think of as Venice becomes the tourist center and heavy industry is moved across the lagoon over to Marghera, Porto Marghera. And so, they, people like Volpe, they have it both ways. You know, he's making money in tourism and he's making money in heavy industry. Um, but it saves Venice in a certain sense from physical destruction, but then it brings in its wake then mass tourism. And where do you stand on mass tourism? You know the it, question's coming. You're, you're yeah. an expert on Venice. It's tough. I mean, it's oh, really what? tough. Um, uh, I've got to go in June with my niece and grand nephews. They're coming and I'm dreading it because it's June. Um, and I was there in November and it was great because it, there was nobody there. But even in November, when I thought there'd be nobody there, there were, you know, I didn't have make reservations in restaurants. But I could walk in and get a table, but there were still surprising number of tourists in November. So you know, the city is overwhelmed. Um, yeah. You know, it I mean, really your, is. Your sensibilities, as someone who loves Venice, have got to be outraged when you see a picture of a 25-story cruise ship right there on the canal. Yeah. yeah. There's something just wrong about that. There's just yeah. something just, your your senses rebel against it. Absolutely. Well, well and it's ironic. Topple over and crush the city. <laughs> well, I know. I mean, well, I, I remember years ago walking to work one morning while going to the archives of the library and looking down and seeing a cruise ship had run into the city. It had literally banged into the walls down by the Biennale Gardens, you know. And uh, so, yeah, it, it literally uh, came crashing in. Um, but yeah, it, well, actually, today I was reading the Venetian paper this morning and they started today or yesterday they've now got this little tax on tourists coming in really? and if you're not spending the night 
um, or you don't have some other dispensation, you're supposed to pay like five euros. Um, so it's a slight effort to try to stem a little bit of the flow coming in. I got. I have to. I have to add just parenthetically that one surefire sign that you are dealing with a premium quality Venice nerd <laughs> is when he just casually drops. I was reading the Venice paper. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you know that you're dealing with the real deal. <laughs> Well, I have to stay. Up. I have to stay up on things, right? <laughs> uh, but it, at the very end of your book, no spoilers here. But at the very right. end of your book, you allude to the possibility that those cruise ships might be irrelevant in the long term. You mentioned a horrible word called silting. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> the possibility that Venice will be landlocked. Yes, I mean. Well, I think in the end it will be because um, the Alps and the Apennines are eroding, and all that all that rock's got to go somewhere, and it's all floating down those rivers towards Venice. Um, and I mean, the great example, of course, is Ravenna, uh, which you know uh, was right on the edge of the water and is now 15 miles inland. Um, and, you I was know- I'm gonna pick now, an older example myself. I was gonna pick Ostia <laughs> in yeah. ancient Rome, but, but it happens. What well, the point is this happens. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. and so while we're all worried about, rightly worried about rising sea level, um, I, in, you know, in geological terms, in geological time, the, the real threat is going to be the silting and basically Venice will be landlocked someday. <laughs> okay, long may that day be postponed. <laughs> but in, right. when you're looking at the, the full stretch of Venetian history in between the time when, you know, these gigantic pylons are sunk into the mud and right. the silting, you know, however many years from now, when you look at that entire stretch of history, the stretch of history that you cover in this book, Mm -hmm. Are there, is it, is it unforgivably American to ask if there are takeaways, <laughs> if there are takeaways from that? Like, for instance, the, the, that entire stretch of Venetian history, was that a mostly free history? Get back to the question of freedom. Yeah, I mean, it was. And of course, the Venetians really played on that idea. I mean, they emphasized that when the city was founded, there was nothing there, right? It was out in the middle of a lagoon. They were not subject to anyone else. I mean, the Holy Roman Empire is right on their border, right? The papacy is right to their southern border. And so they were very, they constantly drove home the idea that we are Terra Nova, we are new land, we are not subject to anyone else. And so they, in their foundation legends, they played on that idea that this was, they were a chosen people, right? I mean, and they played on the idea they were kind of the new Israelites, just as, you know, the, uh, Moses had led the Israelites across the sea uh, to save them from Pharaoh. So Venice was born out in the water, and it literally was protected by its physical isolation out in the lagoon. It was twice attacked um, by Pepin, Charlemagne's son, in 810. And then it was attacked in the, by the Genoese in 1379. And both times the lagoon was its salvation. Um, the um, the uh, invaders never could get across. Um, so yeah, freedom was, uh, they would have used the word liberty. Um, they would have said they, they enjoyed a liberty um, that came from God, they would have thought, and from their natural environment as well. Uh, takeaways. I, I struggle with that a little bit. I mean, I think um, there are two or three. One is uh, uh, adaptability, you know, that one needs to change with the times and be willing to recognize that things aren't the way they were. Um, although the Venetians always say, yeah, but we're going back to old times. Um, they mentally have a hard time accepting change, but they change all the time. A second one I already mentioned is, I think, be open to immigration <laughs> and to be open to immigrants. I mean, Venice is constantly, was constantly replenished by new people. Um, and so I think, you know, that's what made Venice from famous people like 
you know, the artists who come, Veronese coming from Verona, you know, um, El Greco spending time. That's where he gets his name. He's the Greek. You know, he's coming from Crete. He, of course, becomes most famous once he moves to Spain. But, you know, he comes to Venice. He learns a lot about painting. He's tremendously influenced. And then he moves on. Um, so that would be, I think, another takeaway. Um, those, I think, would be my main ones. I just realized what a quintessentially book reviewer question that was. <laughs> you work for years and years and years. You study better for 20 years. You get into a conversation with a book reviewer and he says, so what's the gist? <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. It's an important question. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, I mean, why do we write history except to try to find, you know, lessons? Um, now, whether we learn from those lessons is another question, but, you know. I'm wondering, though, you mentioned El Greco and and you could have mentioned a million other people. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm wondering how much focus, when people talk about this book with you, I'm wondering how much focus will be the staggering amount of art and literature that comes out of Venice, that is that filters through it, not necessarily Venetians, although plenty of them, but lots of other people, too. It's like you say, people come and absorb a lot before they move on. Right. I wonder if, if art will be the focus of a lot. Surely it must have tempted you. Well, I certainly hope it will. I mean, I one of the things I've tried to do in a lot of my work is to, to really marry history and art history together. Um, when I wrote a biography of Doge Fuscri, there weren't personal papers except for his will. And um, what I tried to use in that book was the monuments that he built as a way to get at who he was. Uh, and so I've always tried to integrate the art into the story. And of course, because that's what the Venetians are doing themselves, right? I mean, it is... I think we need to think of it in many ways as the media of the time period, you know, and that people were starved for images in a way that we never will be, right? Right. I mean, we see this morning, you and I have looked at a thousands of images already today by looking at the internet, by watching the television, by whatever. They walked in, you know, you would have gone, you would have spent your whole life looking at a painting in a, in your parish church. Yeah. And you would know that painting in ways you would have thought about that painting um, for years and years. And it would be a source of, um, of, of contact for you. There's a wonderful story that a Renaissance diarist tells of a painting by Titian, where it's a, it's a painting of, uh, I think it's saints being presented to the Virgin. And people are talking about this painting in terms of political, um, it's political meaning at the time. Um, you know, one saint saying, well, this guy became elected doge because he was born on my saint's day. And another guy says, no, he was elected doge because he won his victory on my saint's day. So, you know, they're looking at paintings in all kinds of ways. We think, oh, they're praying in front of these paintings. Yeah, they are, but sometimes they're reading these paintings as political commentary. Or they're just having fun with them. Underscored even more by how much great artwork in Venice can't be moved. Yeah. So you would have to go and look at it to know what right. it looks like. So, so before this, you're entirely right about the surfeit of images. <laughs> We've gone yeah. to the point now in the 21st century where we don't recognize the power of images at all. Yeah, yeah. I, watched, yeah. I uh, mean, absolutely. You know, old Greyhound this morning, someone put a TikTok video up of an 11-year-old Greyhound who was kind of unhappy. So he, he looped his big head over and went, ooh. And I watched that. <laughs> and as far as I can tell, millions of other people did too. Imagine such a trivial thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> but I think, you know, they're using art and architecture and really, I mean, the the I've got obviously Santa Maria del Salute behind me. You can't see at the top of the dome, but on this smaller dome, there's St. Mark and he's manning the rudder of a ship. Mary's at the top and she's holding the baton of command. So this is where the Judeca and the Grand Canals meet. So, you know, they're steering the ship estate right here, you know. Um, so, you know, they're sending messages through this art all the time. Um, and they're trying to put forward a vision. I I, uh, I teased you just a bit about having a Cataletto painting on the cover of your book. <laughs> but, and I'm wondering if that isn't among, uh, in addition to the proficiency, the brilliance, I'm wondering if that isn't part of the appeal. Cataletto is very much showing you a photograph before they existed. He's 
he's trying to show you something what it actually looks like no no you know putty up in the air no nothing like that he's trying to show you what you would have seen if you've been standing at this window yeah except you know he actually manipulates the images i mean there are paintings of his where if you're looking you they're not things are not aligned the way he has them you can so he's the photo. yeah he's creating them in a um, you know, he's creating an idealized image in his own way. It looks like a photo, right? We think, well, that's what it looks like. But he's idealizing the city as well. Mm -hmm. And he's doing it largely for an English upper class audience. You know, um, they're buying these paintings, taking them home like we buy a postcard or used to buy a postcard. Um, and, uh, you know, it becomes this you have to have in your English country house, a canaletto. Um, and then... Mm -hmm the people from those country houses have to send their, their sons to Venice, right? That's that, right. That becomes part of it too, is that those people are people, Venice suddenly becomes a spot to go and see. That's right. It's, it's the main, one of the major education points on the grand tour. So you go to learn about Republicanism. Um, you also go to learn about Venice's famous courtesans, right? I mean, you know, the young men who are going there are getting a double education uh, in governance and in other things. Um, and it's this kind of, you know, a repulsion a attraction at the same time because it's Catholic Italy, right? So that's kind of verboten for, you know, Protestant England. But on the other hand, it's kind of exciting because it's alluring um, in its own way. And the Venice that most of those people saw, those boys on their grand tours, the grandees who go and look, the Venice that most of those people saw would strike us as dirty, right? It, oh. was, it was a working city. Filthy. Oh, yeah. It wouldn't. It wasn't prettified at all. They no. would do something. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, one would like to go back, but only for like fifteen minutes to, you know, <laughs> to, you know, to the to the to a any early <laughs> modern city. Um, I mean, the smells must have been extraordinary. Now, you know, I mean, you know, every American city though, up until you know the nineteen twenty, you know, was full of horses and it smelled like a stable. Um, and so actually a lot of people are now working on sort of the sense of smell in cities. Um, and there's a lot of work, interesting work being done. Um, and I suppose as you walk through a city, you would have known where you were, not only by sight, but by smell, right? right. If you're at the butcher's market, you know it. Right. Um, right. And if work, you, munitions, gunpowder, yeah. wax. Yeah. No yeah. matter what it is, you'd, you'd be able to, know. even the leather of books. Yeah, you exactly. Tell where yeah. you were. Um, yeah, you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation. You mentioned that COVID helped a lot in kicking this book out the door, and I'm sure that you were fascinated by the pictures that we all saw during COVID of the what the canals looked like when all of a sudden there was nobody in the city. I'm I'm sure that some of those pictures were doctored, but some of them were real, weren't they? Oh, I think they absolutely were. I mean, I think they really were. I mean, they were real. I mean, there were dolphins back in the lagoon again, just swimming around. And, you know, it gave me great hope, you know, and you know, that the when the Anthropocene's over, you know, that nature will come back. It you know, I mean, it sounds terrible to say, but, you know, I mean, I'm kind of rooting for the dolphins, you know, and uh, <laughs> you know, you know. so... so we're yeah. about to run out of time. I don't want to. I don't want to cut off in mid sentence. We mentioned silting up in the distant, in the distant future, and when I mentioned the present, there was a distinct pained expression on your face. <laughs> Just a distinctly pained. I would like to. I would like to finish up with what you think the immediate state of Venice is right now. The immediate future. Should Venice, I mean, five euros. For for a walk around for a, basically a fat American tax, <laughs> is should it be more than that, or maybe should there be something worse than that? No cruise ships coming anywhere near. Uh, yeah, well, that that's not going to happen. I mean, you know, really? I mean the the economic factors are just too great. There's too many people making too much money on tourism that it's not going to disappear. To me, I mean, I think there are two things that I would like to see happen. One is the university has expanded dramatically. So the, there's now 20,000 students at the University of Venice. So a lot of old buildings have been converted into dorms and things like that. One plan is to try to make Venice a kind of clean, high-tech industry site, um, you know, because you could do a lot of, of, you know, computer work and 
high tech stuff in Venice, would which would not harm the infra the the historic city the way um, you know that heavy industry would. Um, I would love, I mean, I would love to see more, you know, public housing for, you know, non elite Venetians so they could stay in their houses yeah. um, and not have to move to the mainland. But we're all culpable. I mean, I go and to, I'm sorry for them to get living arrangements on the mainland and, and rent out their, right. their, you know, their quarters in the city. Or if they want to buy, they just simply can't afford to buy in the city because, um, you know, someone who's currently owns a place, they put it on Airbnb, we're all culpable, right? And they can make in three or four days what they would be able to charge a local for a month's rent. Uh, so that's a problem, you know. Um, but, you know, I think bringing in lots of young people, which the university is doing, is is a good sign. Um, and so I'm hopeful in that sense. The tourism wave, you know, Venice is not the only place suffering from it. Florence, Rome, a lot of other places. Um, but, you know, again, if I don't take the geological long view, but the sort of 50 year long view, who knows what mass tourism will look like in 50 years or whether it will exist. And so this may just be a blip in the moment. Um, Strongly recommend the book. 